Good morning and welcome to the Trusted CI webinar for July 23rd, 2018. I'm your host, Jeanette Dopheide. Trusted CI is the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, and these webinars are part of its mission to deliver high quality, actionable guidance regarding cybersecurity to the NSF community. More information about Trusted CI can be found at trustedci.org. Today's topic is Trustworthy Computing for Scientific Workflows with Mayank Varia and Andre Lapitz. Before we begin, I have a few items to note. First, this presentation is being recorded. Second, participants are welcome to ask questions during the session using the chat box uh, that we already just tested out. So type questions here. Um, and we will be following the chat during the presentation, but we will also be taking questions at the end as well. And with that, I will put myself on mute and let uh, Mayank and Andre introduce themselves. All right, thank you very much. Um, I'm Andre Lapitz. I'm a, a CS professor at Boston University uh, and uh, director of research development at the Herrera Institute at Boston University. And, and I'm Mayan Feria. I'm a research associate professor at Boston University. Uh, and my specialty is in cryptography, which is one of the topics of today's discussion. All right. Uh, so today we're going to talk about um, some of the background and work that we're doing at Boston University on uh, infrastructure for trust trustworthy computing, uh, in particular using technologies like uh, secure multi-party computation. So nowadays there's a lot of data available to uh, private organizations, governments, uh, nonprofits, uh, and other groups. And there's a tension right now between the uh, responsibility of holding onto that data potentially for long periods of time in order to extract value from it uh, through analysis and, and possibly also joining of data sets uh, and the, the risks associated with actually maintaining that uh, and safeguarding that data over those uh, long periods of time. Uh, and uh, one, of the th one of sort of the, the benefits of cryptographic techniques, particularly contemporary cryptographic techniques, such as the ones that we're going, going to be talking about today, uh, is that this tension can be resolved uh, at, at some cost of performance and some other trade-offs, but this tension can be resolved, um, allowing uh, the benefits of data analysis uh, across data sets uh, that may be housed in many different organizations uh, um, to be leveraged despite the fact that no one actually has to collect the data all in one place or have responsibility for holding it uh, and protecting it. So just a brief uh, background of how Boston University got involved in this area. Um, uh, within uh, the city of Boston, uh, the Boston Women's Workforce Council and the Office of the Mayor um, started an initiative to uh, measure the wage gap across genders and ethnicities uh, and um, uh, levels of uh, sort of uh, seniority uh, of employees across the Boston area. And one of the requirements of this uh, initiative for signatories who uh, agreed to participate uh, in addition to uh, you know, uh, participating in workshops and, and following best practices uh, was to evaluate the, the success and, and the progress of this, um, of this initiative. Uh, and initially the idea was to have this data compiled by a third party, basically collecting um, uh, employee wage data from uh, possibly hundreds of companies in the Boston area and then doing an analysis over it. Um, and what Boston University was involved in was uh, we actually helped them build an infrastructure that allowed hundreds of companies over the web uh, to submit their data. Uh, and this has been done on uh, three occasions at this point. Uh, and two of those reports have already been published uh, with the results. Um, and uh, you can see there the 2016 and 2017 uh, data analyses involved uh, quite a large number of employer organizations and um, a large fraction of the um, uh, employees across the Boston area were represented uh, in the analyses. So um, to kind of then uh, move up from, uh, from that to a, a slightly more abstract view of the situation, um, the way that we uh, created an infrastructure for that scenario as well as uh, what you could do in others is basically to ask the question, normally in a situation like this, you have multiple companies or organizations that have data sets that they would like to combine and then analyze. And the traditional view might uh, look something like this, where you have a trusted third party that will take all the data, uh, protect it while it's uh, being housed within that organization, and then run some kind of algorithm or analytic over it uh, and produce some kind of result. The result can then be shared either with the companies or with uh, some other uh, party. Uh, but obviously the trusted third party controls uh, to whom it reveals those results. So, 
this, of course, again, requires a trusted party. And the question arises, can we replace that with something else so that company A and company B, in this case, don't have to transfer their data to a trusted third party and have it uh, be at risk? And also so that a third party does not need to take on the liability of collecting and housing that data from these two companies uh, before the results are computed. So a uh, cryptographic primitive uh, that has existed for some time now, for 35 years, at least in theory, called secure multi-party computation actually allows, uh, provides one way in which this can be achieved. Um, so the idea here is that instead of taking their data sets, the participating companies actually split their data sets in a way that makes, them, makes the individual components, uh, once they're split, look random. Uh, and sends that off to potentially multiple organizations that are not going to uh, cooperate with one another, that are not going to share data with each other. Uh, and as a result, each of these organizations actually is not exposed to the liability of holding the data set because what they're holding is actually just uh, gibberish from the perspective of anyone looking at it. Um, and nevertheless, these organizations that received this gibberish data uh, are able to run an algorithm together with one another, again, sending only cryptographically um, protected and uh, meaningless uh, pieces of data to one another. They're able to compute some kind of algorithm uh, or some kind of statistical uh, analysis. Uh, the trade-offs here are that the cost of computing and the cost of communication of this process, as well as the requirement for multiple parties who are not going to collude with each other, um, are necessary in order to accomplish this. So there are a couple of things to um, uh, keep in mind uh, when, you're, when you're talking about this MPC primitive and what its capabilities are and the scenarios in which um, they can be used. So one important insight is that MPC does not protect uh, the results. So whatever results everyone agrees to compute, whether or not you use MPC or some other technique like a trusted third party, the results will be revealed. So if the results leak information, if, if the query is something like, you know, find me the youngest person in your data set and give me their name, that information will be leaked from the resulting and cannot be hidden using MPC. So that's an important uh, thing to remember. Um, one thing you can do, of course, uh, is use other techniques to address those problems and they are compatible, orthogonal, but compatible with MPC. So for example, uh, differential privacy is a way to actually protect individuals within data sets. Um, and what you can do is basically run some kind of de-identification or uh, differential privacy approach under MPC so that even though you are, um, you're, you're still sort of relying on this other technique, you don't need to take that data and uh, send it off to a third party. You still have um, uh, this collective uh, process that, that does the computation and the de-identification algorithm uh, all at once. And you can think of situations where uh, this actually is beneficial. Um, for example, uh, if you are de-identifying your data, uh, in the traditional scenario, you may have the organizations de-identify their data in advance before sharing them with a third party. And what that means is that if, for example, you would like to take two data sets from two different organizations and join by some kind of identifier that uh, I can identify individuals, um, as you can see in the bottom of this diagram, that's not possible because the data has already been de-identified. If you're using MPC, you can actually, under MPC, do the join by an identifier without revealing the identifiers or anything else to, to anyone and then de-identify after that or apply differential privacy after that uh, to the result. So this basically gives you new kinds of workflows that were not possible before uh, because you are uh, taking this uh, workflow and you're um, uh, executing it under um, uh, an MPC protocol. Um, so this you know, allows things like intersections, longitudinal studies and, and uh, other kinds of applications that may not have been possible before. So there's one additional kind of uh, use to keep in mind when you're thinking about MPC. It's the fact that you, even though MPC will reveal the result, you can choose under MPC not to reveal a result if it doesn't satisfy certain criteria. You might, for example, uh, create a computation that says, if the result will reveal information about an individual, do not uh, return that result. Uh, if, if, you know, and on the other hand, if it's safe according to some statistical criteria, then you can reveal it. Obviously that does reveal uh, whether the computation gave you a result that was safe or not, you're leaking that information, but that could be the maximum that you need to leak. Uh, the difficulty also with this technique is, again, you do have to have an algorithm to determine whether something is useful and you need to decide on that in advance. It cannot be something that you um, uh, have control over once the protocol has, has started. So you need to know that before, maybe even before you've seen the data. And that's certainly a, a challenge with applying this kind of approach, but it is, uh, it is possible. 
So we wanted to just briefly go over the technique for anyone who's not familiar with it. And uh, we use this very simple example of uh, computing a sum. So what we have here are three parties, I'll call them X, Y, and Z, that wish to uh, protect their private information. In this case, they are the numbers X for the party that holds X, the, the number Y, and so on. Uh, they would like to not reveal that number to, to anyone else. But at the same time, th these three organizations would like to compute the total of these uh, three numbers. So the expression above X plus Y plus Z. Uh, and they would all like to have uh, the result. So one approach, uh, and this is uh, just uh, additive secret sharing, uh, it's, a, it's a fairly basic technique and there are far more sophisticated techniques that allow you to uh, basically con convert arbitrarily complex algorithms uh, into um, MPC algorithms, but this sort of illustrates one technique that can be used. So what's going to happen here uh, in order to uh, proceed is that each of the three parties are going to split their number um, in some random way into three pieces. And it's important to note that the way that they do this is um, uh, looks random from the perspective of anyone who's looking um, at, these, um, uh, at these numbers from the outside. So when they see x3, it's not going to tell them anything about what the original value x is. Now, I know in the diagram, you can see that you know, upper bounds might leak. What you do is you actually do modular arithmetic so that uh, everything wraps around and, uh, and that doesn't happen. But we usually use this diagram because it's a little easier to, uh, to see the, the concept. So what's going to happen with these secret shares, these three pieces that everyone uh, has uh, created individually, I'm going to look at things from the perspective of X for a second, uh, is that um, each party will send these pieces to each of the other two parties. So now, uh, at the end of this process, uh, what's going to happen is each party now sees a piece of the actual input X, each of the other parties sees a piece of the actual input X, but as I mentioned, uh, that input is compatible with all possible original values of X from the perspective of, in this case, let's say Z. So Z can't really infer much uh, from the fact that it sees, or anything uh, uh, if you're using modular arithmetic, from the fact that it sees this uh, value X3. So then all three parties actually do the same thing uh, in parallel. Uh, and now you have each of the three uh, parties um, in possession of uh, a piece of each of the three inputs to the summation. So now the three parties can all compute the local sum of the pieces that they possess. And then they can actually go back and send this around to everyone else. And now we can actually see that in this case, because the uh, party X here is receiving a sum of Y2 and Z2 and a sum of Y3 and Z3, it's actually the case that because they don't know how that split actually occurs, because all they get is the total there, what they're observing is actually compatible with all possible values y prime and z prime. In other, way, in other words, you can pick any y prime and z prime you want, and from the perspective of x, that could be a possible input to the summation x plus y plus z. So x has actually, you can sort of prove this with uh, some linear algebra, uh, you don't really need much more than that. Uh, uh, you can have a mathematical proof that x has learned nothing about uh, the values y and z. So uh, basically, that's the uh, quick overview of how this technique works. Um, and uh, essentially, this allows all three parties to, uh, in this case, compute the summation, because all they have to do now is add up these pieces together. Uh, and they'll have individually uh, the total, but they will not have uh, seen the individual inputs of any of the other uh, three parties. Um, so uh, now we'll kind of uh, switch over from this uh, brief tutorial. Uh, which hopefully gave you uh, some idea of how these techniques work and, and sort of the guarantees that they provide. Um, and, and we'll sort of uh, go into a, a bit more background about, um, about MPC. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks, Andre. Uh, so I want to talk, as Andre just said, about sort of uh, there's this thing called secure multi-party computation. We saw how it does, uh, how you, you can add numbers privately without ever having to share your inputs. In principle, it can do uh, any computation. And so what I want to talk about in, my, uh, in, in the rest of the time here is sort of what we are doing at Boston University in order to uh, make this system uh, make something like secure multi-party computation used more frequently in practice. And there are many people who are working to make secure multi-party computation more usable. And there are many different dimensions to what the word usable might mean. Uh, one thing that I want to sort of put aside at the beginning of this conversation is performance at small scale. I want to argue that there's been a lot of effort over the past half decade even in making secure multi-party computation actually quite usable for reasonably medium-sized analytics over small-scale data. 
So I have here a chart for the throughput of running a computation. For whatever reason, uh, running the advanced encryption standard AES has been sort of a de facto benchmark for people who work in this space to sort of compare the performance of different systems. Uh, AES is a, is a system, uh, is a computation that runs at sort of nanosecond level speeds on your computer when just run in the clear on data that you have on your computer. Uh, and you can see on this graph over the past half decade, the, the throughput of uh, running the system under secure multi-party computation has grown up uh, very, very quickly. The y-axis here is a log scale graph uh, and is basically now within about two orders of magnitude of running the calculation in the clear. So something like a 60 to 70 X overhead of running this computation using secure multi-party computation, i.e. where the parties are doing this computation over data that they cannot see versus doing it in the clear over data that they can see. So 60x is definitely not nothing, as, as Andre mentioned from the very beginning of this talk. Uh, the system called Secure Multi-Party Computation has some overheads overdoing uh, calculations in the clear, but uh, in many circumstances, this may be uh, very acceptable for any kind of uh, you know, business or government workflow. So for instance, to use our, uh, uh, the example that Andre gave at the beginning, our work with the city of Boston to calculate the wage gap between men and women for them, uh, number one, the calculation that they wanted to compute was relatively simple. And number two, the bottleneck for them to actually do all this work where most of the effort went was at sort of the human side of the problem, convincing all of these companies to sign on board and having them all look up the data for internally within their own, own organization and contribute it on. The actual act of computing uh, the, the sort of the pay disparity between men and women is a calculation that would be, you know, a nanosecond or microsecond scale in the clear. So maybe, maybe uh, using secure computation, it now became a millisecond to second level operation. But again, in, in the weeds, this took, you know, a year to convince all the companies to apply and a week for all of them to contribute all their data. The second that it took the computer to run this was not really a big deal. So sort of running secure multi-party computation today for relatively small scale data, I think is very uh, feasible. Um, so what I want to talk about, uh, focus on, is sort of two uh, dimensions for where we could go from here from a usability standpoint. One is scaling uh, secure multi-party computation up to big data environments. And another dimension is making secure multi-party computation easier to use from the perspective of an analyst of a data scientist who uh, wants to run some sort of query and does not want to write the code to do what Andre just described in terms of uh, all that networking back and forth for the X1, X2, X3 pieces and so on. Uh, so the system that I want to describe to you is called Conclave. It's a, it's a software package that we've built here at, uh, at BU together with folks at MIT as well. Uh, and it's a, a system that sort of makes MPC easy to use for relational queries, or bringing MPC to anybody who knows uh, SQL. So it, it's, it's basically a, a compiler process. If you give it a SQL query, it can compile it down and on the back end do all of that kind of uh, work that Andre was describing in terms of sending shares of secrets back and forth between different parties. Uh, behind the hood, it has uh, two big things that help it from a performance point of view to do the scalability up to big data. One is a static analysis tool that basically tries to identify when secure multi-party computation is needed. So if you give it a big relational query, it can identify automatically which pieces of a computation can be run solely on your own data in order to synthesize it into a smaller form before doing a global computation that would need to use secure multi-party computation. And the second piece is it has a notion of hybrid operators basically to say, if there is some limited amount of trust that you have in the system, then how can you exploit that to get even more performance? So for instance, maybe all of us have some sort of sensitive data, but maybe there's one column within all of our data sets that we're willing to allow Andre to see, because for some reason we all trust Andre with that particular column of data, then the system could potentially be even faster because Andre could help us out with things like join operations. Uh, so we have a prototype implementation. It's available on GitHub. It supports uh, uh, multiple different uh, software packages that do secure multi-party computation. And perhaps even more interestingly, it supports taking data directly from existing backend data stacks such as Spark or Hadoop. So basically it can take the data where it already lives in, in many different uh, commercial or government organizations without having to port it into any kind of different interface, pull the data as necessary, and uh, and run secure multi-party computation uh, uh, of analytics over it. 
Uh, so I'll give you an example here. Uh, it looks like the animations might be a little bit off the slide, but uh, so to, to I'll walk you through a, a simple example here that, that we've used for testing out uh, uh, our, our Conclave software system. So suppose there are many different uh, taxi or ride sharing companies like uh, uh, the Ubers and Lyfts of the world, uh, and all of them have data about the passengers, about the rides that their passengers have taken. And say there's a regulator, like in New York City, the Taxi and Limousine Commission, the TLC, that wants to understand something about the, the, the market that they're in, so, so that, they're, that they're regulating, excuse me, questions like, you know, how concentrated is the market for hired vehicles? Is this a competitive marketplace or is it a monopolistic one? Uh, so if that uh, a regulator has access to all of the data, then that's something that is very easy to calculate. There are metrics for uh, that economists have, uh, have created for market concentration, like a metric called the HHI. Uh, so if you have all the data, then this is an easy question to answer. You can simply write a SQL query, and I claim that something of this form is more or less the SQL query to compute market concentration. Uh, and anybody who knows SQL could do this if you had all the data in one relational database. Uh, the question is, what do you do when you don't have all the data in one database? What if the regulator wants to make this query directly on the data sets of all of the different uh, companies that are involved in, in, in servicing New York City from a, from a taxi service point of view. Um, so what would be nice is if we could just have a one line annotation that just basically says, here's where the data lives. So this is some actual conclave code. So we just sort of say data and the analyst, the regulator here could simply define a table that has some sort of schema that whatever it is, uh, and just simply says like, hey, by the way, all the data actually live at these places, at company A, company B, and company C. Um, but for the perspective of the rest of my uh, uh, query, just treat it as though I have all the data, but you know, remember on the back end that that's where the data actually live at. Um, but then otherwise, uh, the, the regulator who's doing this, uh, this query can simply write a SQL style query to compute uh, any kind of uh, metric of interest, such as this HHI uh, uh, metric of market concentration. And it's basically, our, our language is very SQL-esque. It has all the same operators like projections, sums, joins, et cetera. Uh, and importantly, the analyst here is, is encoding everything after the first line, everything uh, new here is encoded as if the, the data all lived at the analyst. But on the back end, Conclave will simply understand, thanks to the annotation on the first line, we'll understand where the data actually live and we'll do the the porting to understand, okay, if the analyst wants to run these kinds of queries, what actually needs to be executed on the back ends of the three companies in order to support it. So Conclave manages this behind the scenes. So the, the, uh, the analyst doesn't have to do so. And as I mentioned before, uh, behind the scenes, Conclave is also doing a bunch of tricks with static analysis in order to try to minimize the use of secure multi-party computation. So here's a slide of showing uh, the performance and scalability of Conclave. On the x-axis is the running time of different systems that might execute exactly the HHI example from the previous slide. Sorry. Running time is on the y-axis. Uh, sorry, sorry, I meant y-axis is running time. Thank you, Andre. Uh, and on the x-axis is the number, the size of the number of inputs that each of these parties might have. Uh, in reality, just to give you the idea of the scale, in reality in New York City, there are approximately 175 million taxi trips per year. So that would be the data set that would be run on practice on that kind of uh, query. Uh, and we see here that the, the um, systems that do secure multi-party computation just over the entire workflow, uh, like the one in blue, uh, which uses ShareMind, which is one of the MPC libraries that are available, uh, they basically top out at something like 10,000 records or 100,000 records. Uh, note that the x-axis is on a log scale. Whereas both computing over the data in the clear and also computing over it using our Conclave engine uh, can scale much, much better to the order of tens or hundreds of millions or even billions of records, uh, depending on the running time that you're willing to tolerate. So with, uh, with Conclave, we can get something to, you know, up to five orders of magnitude uh, improvement over running uh, some existing legacy secure multi-party computation systems, all while getting the exact same security guarantee. So that's the Conclave software system that we've, uh, we've built. In the final part of this talk, what I want to describe is what we're doing with Conclave now as part of our cybersecurity for cyber infrastructure, our CICI project. Um, so we've spent this time building this Conclave system, which we think is really nice and has the you know, potential, the capacity to be used to solve a lot of people's problems, to make it uh, accessible to a lot of 
uh, uh, data analysts and data scientists. Uh, but that's just the possibility exists with Conclave. What we want to do now, what we are doing now, I should say, uh, is to connect it to a place where we think it actually will help to connect uh, the Conclave software to where the data actually live and where social scientists in particular uh, want to be performing uh, analytics potentially over data that they are uh, uh, that they cannot see for either privacy reasons or any other reason. So uh, what we're doing is connecting Conclave with existing systems called Dataverse and the Massachusetts Open Cloud. I'll describe those to you in, in, in the next few slides. Uh, I'll describe these two systems separately, although they too are in the process of being integrated already. So what are these systems? Uh, Dataverse is a project that comes out of Harvard uh, and it's a repository that social scientists particularly, though anybody in principle could, uh, use to share their data sources, uh, say, say sources that they use as part of producing some sort of academic publication, for instance. Uh, it's a very large repository. It's one of the largest public repositories of scientific information. There are more than 70,000 data sets. Actually, this slide is, is outdated. It's probably bigger than that now. Um, there are you know, millions of, of downloads uh, per year, uh, many tens of thousands per month. Uh, it's a very large scale data uh, repository of many different data sets. Uh, each data set is up to at most about a gigabyte uh, each. Uh, and the, pos the reason to, to have all this stuff in, in one giant repository is to enable reuse, reusability, and reproducibility of science that other people who are not necessarily part of your original data, uh, your original research team can query your data sets in order to see, you know, uh, can see if they can reproduce the results, perhaps with a slightly different query to make sure, say, you're not overfitting, or to be able to connect different data sets that, that you know, if, if research teams A and B each have data sets and research team C wants to understand the correlations between those two, they can. Uh, and you can post the data to Dataverse publicly, in which case anybody could run such an analytic, but you can also post it privately, which means you only want to delegate that only certain people on the system uh, can, can see it. You can say, give the data out by invitation only. And what we want to be doing uh, with Conclave is to connect uh, the Conclave system to the existing Dataverse platform so that uh, you can even compute over data that you cannot see. So, so you don't have to be invited to have the ability to access the data, which may come with uh, privacy issues, ethical issues, IRB issues. It, it, it may be the case that you just want to be able to produce your, you know, run your query for doing uh, reproduction or, or, or reproduce, uh, reproducibility or extension of prior work, that you just want to do that over the data without necessarily even having the liability of being able to see the data. So that's where we want to be going. And the other piece that we're, we're connecting with on this, on this CICI project is the Massachusetts Open Cloud. So what's that? Um, so it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an actual uh, uh, operational cloud that we have running here uh, at Boston University together with uh, a coalition of a bunch of other universities in the, in the greater Boston area. And uh, what it's trying to solve, uh, the MOC is a very large project on its own, and what it's trying to solve is sort of the issues associated with vendor lock-in with public clouds today. So if you use a public cloud system, such as you know, Amazon Web Services or Microsoft Azure or Google Cloud, um, when you buy uh, services from them, it's sort of you buy everything from them at once. You buy the right to rent the machine, I mean, you rent the machines from them, and you have their hypervisors, and you have their isolation mechanisms, et cetera. Uh, and, uh, you know, everything sort of comes from one place uh, and is controlled by a single provider, which makes it hard to innovate for anybody who isn't one of these big companies. And so what, uh, what uh, you know, folks at BU and other places have been working on for the past uh, several years is an open cloud model that is a single data center where anybody can set up machines, uh, any, any provider who wants, any, any owner of hardware uh, can set up machines or any creator of a hypervisor or operating system or other kinds of software can set that up and users can mix and match whichever kinds of hardware and software they need in order to meet any kind of uh, application workflow they have. They can choose what they trust and they can choose what they need. Uh, and this is an existing, uh, you know, it's a, it's a production database, uh, excuse me, uh, data center that is running out in Western Massachusetts right now. It has many different commercial providers behind it. Uh, 
uh, the Dells and Lenovo's of the world providing computing resources and the Cisco's and Brocade's and all of the world providing networking resources, et cetera. Uh, it's a project that's been gone ongoing since 2014. So it's a, it's, a, it's a place where you can have different potentially untrusted, uh, mutually untrusting machines all running within the same data center, which is very useful for the, the way that secure multi-party computation works because as Andre was describing earlier, multi-party computation is exactly what you want uh, the, the whole scenario of secure multi-party computation is when you have uh, a, a common analytic that you want to compute amongst mutually distrusting parties. And having them in the same data center is very uh, nice from us, for us from a performance point of view because MPC tends to be more network uh, bound than it is CPU bound. To use Andre's prior example, uh, when we were computing the sum of three numbers, we had to send these pieces back and forth to one another. So whereas you know, summation uh, was a completely local operation if you did it in the clear and make probably a nanosecond, you know, a one clock cycle or small number of clock cycles level operation. Now with the secure multi-party computation version, there was some networking involved. And so that networking, if you had to do it over the internet would be very bad and very slow. It would be a millisecond level operation as a result. But uh, as uh, within the same data center, these things have multiple tens of gigabit per second links between them. So we can minimize the, the, the burden of, of, of the network component of MPC by running in the MOC. So anyway, these are two systems. Dataverse is, you know, what the social scientists use to store their data. And the mass open cloud is a place where data can live. And these pieces are already being combined into a, a joint system called Cloud Dataverse, which is, you know, using uh, the MOC as a place to host Dataverse repositories. Uh, and what we're doing with this CICI project is integrating Conclave into that. So now we have like sort of the intersection of all three of these pieces. Uh, the, the benefit of integrating Conclave with Dataverse is to bring our software for cryptographically secure computing to the place uh, that people are already using to, to store the data. It's where the data already live. And the benefit of combining uh, with the Mass Open Cloud is to leverage this, this uh, unique structure that the MOC has for mutually un, uh, untrusting machines all living in the same data center with really high speed networking uh, between them. And sort of by combining all three of these pieces, we think it's, it's a really nice triumvirate that has uh, the ability to really change how data science and data analytics can work, that we can sort of uh, build a system where everybody's uh, responsibilities for everyone involved in data science can really be isolated from each other. So if I'm an IT staff uh, employee, if I'm the person who's in charge of uh, of maintaining and administering a box, I can do so even though all the data on the box are encrypted or encoded, meaning I can manage the sort of driver support or the operating system updates or whatever it is that I'm supposed to do, even without needing to read the data, that even with my super user privileges on the machine, I still have no ability to know what the data are that are being protected. Uh, and if I'm, a, if I'm a, an analyst or a software developer who wants to write an analytic, such as the HHI analytic that, that we showed you earlier in this talk, um, I can write that analytic without really having to worry about anything about privacy. I don't need to understand how MPC works. I can just write that workflow as if I had all of the data. And then with Conclave, that will, uh, the Conclave engine on the back end on its own will compile that down to a secure multi-party computation version. I don't have to understand it and so on. So the idea is every single person involved in the data analysis pipeline, you know, they can focus on their job without having to worry about how other people's part of the the act of computing or protecting data in, uh, interact with them. So that's a, a nutshell, in a nutshell, the, the project that, that uh, Andre and I and many others uh, here at Boston University have been doing. So uh, we thank you for your time and we'd be happy to answer any questions that you all have. Uh, great guys. Well, thank you for presenting. I'm just gonna uh, talk a little bit to give people in the audience some time to type out questions. And uh, real quick, I'm just going to grab the screen um, so I can put up some information about our next webinar. Um, so again, thank you uh, both for presenting and we're taking questions now. But in the meantime, uh, we have a survey that we like to distribute to our viewers. And uh, we like this survey uh, we want the feedback, of course, but we also uh, we also would like uh, suggestions for new topics or uh, requests to present. So I'll just put the survey link here. Uh, there you 
you go. And um, our next presentation is, uh, is going to be August 27th at 11 a.m. Eastern. Our topic is NIST 800-171 Compliance at University of Connecticut. And our presenter is Jason Pufal. And uh, to find out more about Trusted CI presentations or to view uh, older presentations, you can go to trustedci.org slash webinars. And with that, I will see if we have any questions here. We've got one. Um, have you received interest from other communities and data owners beyond Dataverse? Um, so, uh... We have uh, received interest from uh, some private organizations as well as from uh, other initiatives um, that the city of Boston um, is running. Uh, one example uh, in Boston that's actually ongoing is the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce. Uh, they are doing an analysis across a, a number of uh, their member uh, organizations uh, to assess um, and hopefully encourage uh, the uh, contracting of women and minority owned businesses in the Boston area. Um, so that's one example that's actually currently uh, being executed. Um, another private uh, nonprofit um, is, uh, the Callisto, is Project Callisto, which is a sexual assault reporting uh, web based service. Um, and we're collaborating with them to uh, introduce some of these technologies into their software stack. Wow, that's incredible. Thank you. That's great work. Um, do we have any more questions from the audience? Uh, here we go. Uh, so MPC supports only those operations that are summative? Uh, so no, uh, MPC supports all possible computations. Um, so the example that I showed today uh, showed how you can support addition. If you represent, uh, if you split the, the inputs using a different approach, not the one I described, but uh, uh, some slightly more sophisticated approaches, uh, then the secret shares, those pieces, um, will actually allow you to do uh, addition and multiplication. Uh, if you can do addition and multiplication, you can do and and or and, and not gates. And at that point, you can do all possible logic gates. So that's one way you can achieve actually Turing completeness. There's many other ways you can do it as well. So there are, there are multiple protocols that support all possible operations. But just to kind of uh, set expectations, uh, certainly if the, um, if, if the uh, algorithm has an affine transformation, so if it's additive or multiplication by public constants, um, that uh, leads to the least uh, communication overhead. So that's highly efficient. It basically doesn't cost any more than to communicate the data in the clear would have cost. Um, as soon as you need to do multiplication and other things, so if you want to start doing standard deviation or correlation, anything more complicated, uh, that's when the communication cost starts to rise. Yeah, so just, just to uh, say one more, uh, just to sort of reiterate that in one sentence, in principle, you can do any kind of computation you want using secure multi-party computation. In practice, the performance will vary depending on the kind of computing you want to do. And one of the big areas of research that we have with Conclave and many others do as well is to try to make more kinds of computations in the good performance bucket. Uh, and so what we had been focusing on with Conclave is uh, SQL style relational queries, but there are other efforts that are taking other, you know, other categories of computing and trying to make MPC more, uh, MPC faster for them as well. Great. Thanks. Um, we've still got some time, so I'll just uh, open up the chat for any more questions. Um, so, so I see a question about what are the limits or what are oh. the, the dimensions of, uh, of the overhead of, of MPC. Uh, so it's actually kind of complicated. Uh, there's no quick and dirty answer that like every computation kind of has its own uh, kind of overhead profile because there's a lot of moving pieces because there is a question of sort of um, what kinds of, of computation you're doing. Some are going to be easier to convert to MPC than others. There's also a question of what kinds of machines or what, what is the, the, you know, hardware profile of what you have sort of what is the, uh, because MPC turns some computing things into operations that require networking, then the question becomes sort of what is, you know, not only the CPU beefiness of your, your setup, but also what are the network connectivity between the various pieces. So 
there's a lot of dimensions to the question of performance. And I haven't even gotten into the question yet about, there's also many different definitions of security for MPC and many different kinds of security guarantees that one can provide. And all of them have their own performance uh, implications. So there's unfortunately no very simple answer about uh, what is the overhead of MPC. And just to comment a little further, um, some of our work currently, as well as the work of others, is looking into quantifying the trade-off between privacy and performance. Um, and, the, and this is something that would actually be kind of a static analysis approach, where you take the algorithm and you analyze you know, uh, how, much, how much do you get for the, the increase in privacy, or how much do you need to pay for the increase in, increase in privacy in terms of compute time or communication overhead. So that's something that I think in the future uh, this is my own personal opinion, but this is probably something that software tools will have to automatically um, uh, provide for software engineers as they're writing algorithms uh, so that they can make the choice that uh, makes sense for a given scenario. So it looks like there's a follow-up question about what things you cannot do ignoring performance. Um, I wouldn't say cannot do, like I said, in principle, you can do anything, but things that you shouldn't do with MPC or things that it makes no sense to do uh, are operations where uh, from the result of the operation, uh, you know, information about the inputs that you were trying to protect would already be gleaned from the output. So this Andre described it earlier in the talk, like MPC protects the process of getting from the inputs to the outputs. It does not protect the output itself on its own. So if the out, if, if for instance, your function is the identity function, you simply take all the inputs and you, you output them, then there is no point in using something like secure multi-party computation because MPC only protects the process, not the answer. That what you would want then instead is something that's doing more to protect the answer, things like the identification or, or, uh, or differential privacy or things like that, which again, you, you, you can combine the two, but in, in a, but, but, it's a question of whether you're concerned about process versus results. Um, another example would be something where the process of computing an answer itself uh, uh, is not just some sort of straight line computation or even some sort of uh, uh, something that can be done on a single machine, but it has artifacts throughout the rest of the world. So sort of uh, if your, your calculation, if, you, if you're doing something like uh, like uh, the, the process itself will send out a beacon, will send out a network packet if the answer is one, you know, and else it won't. Uh, if there are other manifestations of your answer in the world, it's the same kind of thing. If, if, if the calculation itself will broadcast side channels that will tell you information about what the answer is going to be, then MPC is not protecting you from those kinds of side channels. Oh, he said. He says, thanks. Great. Um, do we have any time for, we have time for a, a question or two, uh, if there's any other questions in the audience. So I, I just wanted to know um, if you two had heard of transition to practice or technology transition to practice. Are you referring to the program at NSF? Yes. Uh, yeah. So we actually have a grant uh, that's one year into uh, we're one year into it right now um, to uh, develop some open source libraries that support MPC. And, and among those libraries are actually the one that uh, is being used for the 100 talent uh, Boston Women's Workforce Council example that I referenced at the beginning. Right. Great. Great. Uh, the discussion we had today was more about how to uh, make MPC more accessible for developers to make it easy for anybody who knows SQL to use it to develop, you know, big data style uh, analytics. Uh, I mean, uh, analytics that can run on big data. Uh, whereas the other library that, that um, Andre is mentioning, which is also available at github.com slash multiparty, uh, it's a library that's meant to be web-based, to be as easy for people to use who are inputting information uh, as possible. Uh, so, so sort of a different focus, accessibility for a different uh, usability, I should say, for a different group of people. Great. Well, I think we've uh, co completed all the questions in the chat. Oh, here we've got another one just came in. Uh, thank you for mentioning T TTP transition to practice. Uh, I would like to discuss this further with the speakers if possible. Uh, are either of you available or interested in sharing your email address um, when I send out the uh, video and, and slides? Yes, absolutely. We're, we'd be happy to do that. Okay, I will include that. 
and, and we are very happy about the T TTP program and, and uh, we appreciate the opportunity to, um, uh, to build these transitional sort of uh, technologies, um, uh, you know, with support from the NSF. Yeah, the NSF does so much great stuff and it, it, they, need cheer, they need cheerleaders to get that information out there, you know, so that more people can be using it. Agreed. Um, okay, well, I think we're, we're good. We'll, we'll start wrapping things up. Uh, Andre and, and Mayank, thank you so much for presenting today and thank you audience for uh, watching this presentation. I will be uh, uploading this video and archiving the slides. So just be on the lookout for that in the next day or so. And with that, I will stop the recording and uh, we'll, we'll close up this meeting. Right, thank you very much. Thanks for, thanks for everyone for, for listening.